Hi folks, just because I'm going to be uh, out of state for just uh, the, this class that, you're going to, that I'm going to miss, please, if you have not signed an attendance sheet for the no-show period, please go see Mr. Fred Bowles in CC 1190 and sign an attendance sheet. Please, it is very important. Remember, during the no-show period, if you do not sign an attendance sheet during the first two weeks of class or during the no-show period, if you don't sign any attendance sheet, you will be dropped from the class. You will be no-showed. And that means if you're dropped from a lecture, you will necessarily be dropped from the lab also and vice versa. So please, if you have not signed an attendance sheet, please make sure and go find Mr. Fred Bowles. If he's not in his office at the moment, you might check the physics lab or just check his schedule and see if you can find him sometime. Uh, his office is CC 1190. He'll have my attendance sheets. Okay, thanks a lot. Okay, welcome back. So, uh, last semester, we talked about a lot of different forces. There was the frictional force, gravitational force, normal force, uh, all sorts of different kinds of forces. This semester, we're going to start out by looking at a new force, a force we have not seen before, and that brings us to section 18, entitled Electric Forces and electric fields. Okay, I'd like to start off with a very simple demonstration. Just mat here, and I'm going to put a few uh, little paper circles on it. So these are just some circles from a, um, a hole punch. And I've got a comb here. I'm just going to comb my hair a little bit. Now, in order to do this experiment, you need some very thick hair, like mine, so you probably won't be able to do this at home. Okay, I'm going to take the comb and bring it down near the circles. And we notice that the circles are attracted to the comb. There is a force of attraction between them. Now, that's a very simple demonstration, but that actually shows us a force that is very different than any other force we have talked about before this time. So, what's going on? What force is this? Well, it is a new force and it is the electric force. Uh, this was actually discovered many, many years ago when pieces of amber or fossilized tree resin were rubbed with animal fur. It was discovered that they created a force that could be uh, felt when applied to other objects, like, like uh, the comb and the paper. So this comb actually is, well, what is it? It's a rubber comb, which is another kind of tree resin, and I rub it through my hair, which is like animal fur, and I'm creating this attractive force between the comb and paper. So it's very much like what was originally done with amber and um, and fur. Well, in uh, Greek, amber was called, let me make sure I get these letters right, eta, lambda, epsilon, kappa, tau, rho, omicron, nu, which we might translate as electron, which was the name of amber in Greek. So electron is then where we get the name for electricity and, well, the, the particle electron. Uh, and so, basically, the, uh, the word electricity comes from, or derives from, the Greek name for uh, amber. We say that when something is rubbed, like the, the comb through my hair, we say that it becomes charged or it acquires a charge. Now, without any charge, there is no force. So if you have two uncharged things, there is no force between them. But when objects are charged, there can be a force. Now, 
an individual by the name of Benjamin Franklin who lived from 1706 to 1790 did a lot of work with this electrical force and he defined that should be 90 that's a zero And he described two different kinds of charge. He said that when amber is rubbed with fur, the amber acquires what he called a negative charge, while the fur acquires what he called a positive charge. You can also rub glass with silk so if you take a, a piece of glass and rub it with silk in that case the glass acquires the same kind of charge that the fur does it acquires a positive charge while the silk in this case acquires a negative charge so it was actually Benjamin Franklin who defined these signs for the charges, the positive and negative, which we still use now even for subatomic particles. So the fact that we now call protons positively charged while electrons negatively charged, that fact actually goes back to Benjamin Franklin. Even though he had no idea what protons and electrons were, it was because of his definition of these charges that we now use that um, the, the names of positives and negatives for protons and electrons. If, for some arbitrary reason, he had decided to call the fur negative and the amber positive, we would have positive electrons and negative protons. It's just because of what he decided that, uh, that we still use that. Now, a very, very interesting and important result about these charges is that charge is conserved. Can you remember any of the, the conserved quantities that we talked about last semester? Well, like momentum and energy and angular momentum, those were conserved quantities. And what that meant was th those quantities could not be created nor destroyed. You always had the same amount, total amount, of momentum, for example, before or after a collision, say. Well, charge is another conserved quantity. That means charge cannot be created nor destroyed. Now, what does it mean when we rub something and give something a charge? Well, what that means is we're taking charge from one object and putting it onto another object. So, you can make something positive, but only if you make something negative at the same time. And the amount of positive charge you put on one thing has to be exactly the opposite to the amount of the negative charge that you put on the other thing, so that the total amount always remains constant. So we have the positive charge plus the negative charge always remains constant. That's what we mean by the conservation of charge. The total amount of charge always has to remain the same. This actually makes this uh, positive and negative nomenclature very useful because we can just add quantities together, like uh, if we start out with a positive 3 charge and a negative 2 charge, we can just add them together and that's the same as a positive 1 charge. So we can just add the numbers very, very simply like positive and negative uh, quantities. Now, where do these charge come? Where do these charges come from? Well, uh, Benjamin Franklin didn't know, but we now have a much better idea of where all of these things come from, and they come from the subatomic particles. Atoms are made of positive and negative charges. Inside the center of the atom, or the nucleus of the atom, there are positive charges and neutral charges. The positive charges are protons. The neutral charges are neutrons, and around the nucleus, and this is a very simplistic picture, we'll, we'll look at a more uh, realistic, more complicated picture of the structure of the atom later on towards the end of the semester. 
are negative charges, which we call electrons. And this is essentially where the charges come from. When we charge an object, like the amber or uh, the fur, and we rub some amber with the fur, essentially what we're doing is we're rubbing electrons off of one thing and on to another thing. So the amber is getting extra electrons from the fur, leaving the amber with a negative charge. The fur then ends up losing electrons, so in the, it ends up with a net positive charge. So when we charge things, we're essentially just moving electrons around, leaving things uh, either positive or negatively charged. Now it turns out that the charge of a proton is, as far as we know, exactly opposite to the charge on the electron. So this actually gives us a basic unit of charge that we will use. One proton charge, we will refer to as one electrostatic unit one electrostatic unit, which we will call 1ESU for short, or 1E for even shorter. So 1E is the charge of one electron. The charge of, I'm oh, sorry, uh, the charge of one proton. One electron charge will then be one negative one electrostatic unit, or negative one E. So be careful. Don't think that one E is the charge of an electron. It's the charge of a proton. The electron charge is negative one E. So remember, proton is always positively charged. Electron is always negatively charged. Now, one subatomic particle charge is a very, very small charge. So it's typically not the basic unit that we will use for the SI system. Remember, we have three fundamental units in the SI system. Remember, what, what are they? For length, mass, and time, there are meters, kilograms, and seconds. Well, now we have to add one more fundamental unit, and that is the unit for charge. The SI unit that we will use is called the Coulomb, one Coulomb. And we will write that as one capital C for short. And one Coulomb corresponds to about 6.25 times 10 to the 18th electrostatic units. So just think about this. 10 to the 18, that's, that would be 6 with 625 and then 16 more zeros after it. That's a very, very big number. So one Coulomb actually corresponds to many, 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 many proton charges, okay? A whole bunch of them. Another way we could convert this would be then be one electrostatic unit is 1.60 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs, and that will actually typically be the conversion uh, quantity that I'll use. It's actually 1.602, 1.602 times 10 to the minus 19. Coulombs. That's the, that's the quantity that I will usually use when converting from electrostatic units to coulombs. Okay, now, what about this force? What kind of force do we have when we have charged objects? Well, if we bring two positive charges near each other, the positive charges push each other apart, so they repel each other. If we have two negative charges, the negative charges repel each other. If we have a positive and a negative charge, they attract each other. So, a very general statement that we will use will be like charges repel, unlike charges attract. Okay, so let's keep that in mind. Like charges, in other words, when they have like or similar signs, positive, positive, 
or negative negative, they repel each other. So they actually push each other apart. So two positive charges repel, two negative charges repel. Unlike charges, in other words, one positive, one negative, or one negative, one positive, they will attract each other. So unlike charges, attract. Now, how do materials end up with a charge? I said before that when you rub things together, some charge will go from one object to the other. Well, there's some important ideas behind that that I would just like to mention. Some materials, some materials are very easy to remove electrons from them. Their electrons, their outer electrons are not very strongly bonded and they, they can re be removed relatively easily. Those kind of materials that have electrons that can move through them or off of them relatively easily are materials that allow electricity to go through them fairly easily and these are called conductors. Then there are some materials that are hard to remove the electrons from them. These are materials that do not conduct electricity very easily. These are things that you would put around electrical conductors that would keep the electricity from, from flowing through them. These are called, well, what do you call material that you would put around, say, an electrical wire? An insulator. So these are called insulators. Insulators. And then there are materials kind of in between that have some very, very interesting properties where sometimes you can remove uh, electrons, sometimes it's harder to remove electrons. Materials that are kind of in between here, sometimes hard, sometimes easy, these are in between conductors and insulators and these are called semiconductors. And you might have heard about semiconductors uh, and how important they are to making computers and things like that. Well, it's these uh, interesting properties that allow for semiconductors to be used to make microcircuits and, and things like that and has really helped to revolutionize the entire computer industry. Okay, and there's, there's really a lot of research being, um, uh, going on in semiconductors and the, the um, properties of different kinds of materials. Okay. Now, there are two very important ways of uh, charging objects, and I want to mention these. We're not really going to talk about this much more than just what I'm going to say here, but you might see something like this if you were to take one of those standardized exams, like the MCAT or the L, uh, you know, PCAT or something like that. So I want to make sure to go over this just so you will have seen it in case you need it on one of those exams. But we really won't talk much more about it than that. So two methods of charging an object. One of them is called charging by conduction. Now let's imagine that we have a conductor so here's a conductor. Remember, conductors allow electricity to flow through them very easily. Let's imagine that we've got a, a charged conductor. So this conductor has got, let's say, some extra negative charge on it. Well, I'm going to draw the, the charge like this. Now let's think about this. On the conductor, remember, electricity can flow easily. So the charges can move around in the conductor easily. Well, we've got extra negative charges here. So what are those negative charges going to do to each other? Well, negative charges repel each other, so they're going to try and move apart. They're going to move as far away from each other as they can. Imagine you're at a party and everyone in this party hates each other. What are you going to do? Well, you're all going to move as far apart as you can. You're all going to sit around the outside of the room or something like that. Well, that's what these electrons are going to do. They hate each other. They're all going to move as far apart as they possibly can. So that is a very general result. When you've got uh, charges on a conductor, those 
charges are going to try and get as far apart as possible and they will reside on the very, very outer surface of the conductor. Okay, so here we go. There's a charged conductor. Now let's imagine we have an uncharged conductor. So here's a conductor with no charge on it. Now let's bring this conductor over in contact with the first conductor. So we're going to take this one and we're going to bring this conductor over here so that it touches the first conductor. Let's just for the sake of argument, let's assume that they're both the same kind of material, same size, same shape and everything. Now what's going to happen? Well, the charges on this conductor can now move over to this conductor. So they can actually get even further apart if they spread out. It's like you're at that party and now all of a sudden someone opens a door to another room. Well, half the people are going to go into the other room to get away from the people in the first room. So what happens is half of these charges will move over to the other conductor. And they'll try and spread out as far as possible away from everybody else over here. And now let's take this conductor and move it away from the first conductor again. And what do we have? Okay, so now we have two conductors, each with charge. The charges have separated as much as possible. Well, what kind of charge do we now have on our originally uncharged conductor? Well, we've got the same sign of charge that we started out with on the original conductor. The amount of charge on the original conductor has decreased because some of it has come over onto this one. If they're the same, say, same shape, same size, we actually end up with the same amount of charge on this one as we have on that one. In other words, half of what we started with. So this conductor, we say, has been charged by conduction. By putting this, <coughs> excuse me, by putting this conductor in contact with this one so that they could conduct, charge has moved onto that conductor. So this is what we say is charging by conduction. Now, go look at another method. 